Well. Brian, thank you. David Cameron promised an in-out referendum on British membership of the European Union in 2017 if the Conservative Party wins an outright majority in May's election. With that date getting ever closer, what are Eurosceptic and Europhile groups doing in preparation for this? Adam has been looking into it. Playtime's over and EU referendums on the cards and the Europhiles are getting serious. Last week, a handful of ex-ambassadors, the odd MP and a load of business types gathered to hear from the Vice President of the European Commission, all under the watchful eye of Lord Mandelson, who's co-chair of the campaign to keep Britain in. He told me he's learnt a big lesson from a previous referendum, Scotland. I think they rather woke up to the, you know, the, the dangers of it sort of going wrong. I mean, almost a sort of 10 days uh, before uh, the vote took place. We prepared than that should the eventuality arise uh, that we need to fight a referendum campaign. So are you spending every day thinking about this a little bit or like two hours a week or just at the weekends or? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I work like that. Uh, I have, uh, uh, we meet regularly. Uh, I am amongst others who are, are, are doing some thinking. It's mainly networking, making sure that you know, those who realise what's at stake for our country and what a fundamental national interest it is for Britain to be in the European Union and to continue to be so, that those people are talking to each other. But have they talked about who could front their campaign? If I mention the name David Miliband... What sort of feelings does that stir in you? Well, David Miliband is a great, he's a great figure, uh, uh, but he's got a very important job in New York. So, and I, uh, I, I, so uh, let us, uh, uh, let's, uh, I, I, I couldn't possibly comment on that, as they would say. Business for Britain is a big player on the more sceptical side of the argument. They're encouraging all sorts of people to make negative noises about Europe, including today a bunch of chefs. Although they've not chosen a side yet because they want to guarantee there is a referendum. The focus at the moment is whether we're going to have a referendum at all. Um, you know, we've only got one party uh, out of the three major ones who are committed to a referendum and Labour are spending a lot of time at the moment uh, opposing a referendum, making their supposed pitch to business that they don't want to see an EU referendum, which is odd given the fact that you know, independent polling shows a majority of business uh, leaders actually back a referendum. Rory Brimfield definitely knows what side he's on. He runs the Better Off Out campaign from modest offices on a boat on the River Thames. Are you worried that the pro-European campaign, they've got the money, the big names, the businesses on their side already and it hasn't even started? We have other individuals who have come out on our side, whether it be uh, main people in the city or whether it be people who are on the street. And that's the point. It's about the British people in this case. And so if there's a referendum, uh, we want to be putting the case uh, to the British people. And of course, the British people, we hope, will agree with our side that the UK uh, would be better off outside the EU. The truth is, we're a way off seeing people with funny jumpers in the streets, like the Europe referendum of 1975. That's because there's another vote to get out of the way first. It's called the general election. Adam Fleming reporting. And here in the studio is Matthew Elliott from Business for Britain. Welcome to the programme. First of all, a rather damning assessment there from Peter Mandelson um, of the Better Together campaign. Mm -hmm. What lessons can you learn? Well, you've got to realise that you, you can't wait to the last minute. You've got to speak out very early, and that's certainly the lesson for the business community, which I think they have learnt. I think also you've got to speak out very loud, and you can't say that this doesn't affect you. It's not credible for large companies that are based in Britain not to have a view on whether this matters. And I think most now have come to the view that actually there has to be a board decision um, about whether to stay in or out. And I think that's what we'll see after, after May. So there's some important lessons that we've learned. Right. And, and which way are you going to jump then in terms of the in or out? We know you want the referendum, but which side? And it's far too premature to think about that. We're, first Why? of all, you know, pushing for the referendum, first of all. But then we'll have this whole process of the renegotiation and the whole process of EU reform. We'll be looking to see what sort of reforms we get down the pipeline. Right. I mean, which way... The evidence, as I have seen it, seems to indicate that at the moment you would go for out, that you would back pulling out of uh, the EU altogether. Is that a fair assessment? We don't take an organisational position, but I think it's fair to say that, you know, like Michael Gove, like indeed the Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, if there was a referendum 
reformed EU, you know, I personally would campaign you for out. Right. Now, Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister, says the anti-European camp are framing Europe as a choice between Britain and Europe, in the way the SNP did by framing the Scottish referendum as a choice between Scotland or Britain. Is that the way to frame the debate? Well, I think Gordon Brown is really scaremongery about the prospects of a referendum. You talk about North Korea and what have you. Mm. It reminds <laughs> me of when um, Roland used to say how there'd be three million job losses if we didn't join the euro or how the city of that. London would collapse if we didn't join the euro. You didn't say no, that? No, it just didn't happen. That. What did you say, though? No, no, I, I, I always said that we should keep our minds open about whether we should join the euro. I never campaigned to go into the euro or said three million jobs would be lost. I think the one thing you do have to be careful in this debate is that, that, that we mustn't be play fast and loose with our facts, as Matthew suddenly done. And, and, and certainly, I would never want to say that three million jobs are dependent on membership of the European Union. But you've got to be very sort of very clear that there are very specific industries, like you take the car industry, which, which has over 700,000 people working in it, that, that all four of those key manufacturers all said that if we came out of the European Union and weren't in the single market, then they'd have to go somewhere else. Now, that must be a risk that Matthew can't possibly ignore. Roland was at the heart of the campaign to join the euro, but I think you're right in pointing out the EU affects different sectors in different ways. And it's fair to say that the car industry would face 10% tariffs. But let's not forget that you know, 95% of companies in the UK don't export with the EU, yet they still have 100% of the regulations. Surely that's unfair. Right. What no. do you say about the regulations? Because this is always yeah, brought up. Um, as a result. What regulations are we talking about here? I mean, do we need those? Well, obviously, if you've got a situation where you've got 28 nations uh, trading together, you, you collapse 28 different sets of regulations for one set of new regulations. You have to have some regulations and you have to have the implementation of the single market. We need to be able when there is a fix in, in, in business trading. And, and that, to create a level playing field, you must have some regulation. But at the same time, someone like Franz Timmermans has been very good in saying there is some regulation we don't need, which we should get rid Can of. Can I come in on this mm. point? Because the, the government's own regulatory policy committee last week did a report which showed how you know, the cost of EU regulation since 2013 has cost UK businesses £2.3 billion. Mm. And yet the government's done a very good job cutting regulation by £2.2 .2 billion, a UK-based regulation. So mm. all the good the government's done seems to have been undone by the no. EU. Well, so I hope things improve well, in the future. Well, well, no you know, which can you name me some of the regulations that you would like to see removed? Because um, a lot of them seem to me to be health and safety regulations that actually many companies wouldn't want to lose because they wouldn't be able to sell without them. The government identified some really good regulations that need change in which its what? business task force. You know, everything to do from... Um, you know, certain aspects of um, you know, health and safety, yes, certain aspects of social employment law, right. things like the Working Time Directive, mm. uh, things like the Agency Worker Directive, a whole host of regulations that are added lots of cost to businesses. Do you accept the cost, the cost then, before we, before we have to move on, that, that there is a cost borne by British yeah, but, business? But, uh, of course, and every, you know, every form of government tends to accumulate more powers and tends to over-regulate. But, but Matthew's thing is a complete red herring. There isn't a, a billions of cost of EU regulation. And most of our regulatory uh, burden that Those business are face figures. come from the UK. And it comes from the UK Parliament. And that's the House of Commons Library. And there have been individual businessmen no, who've done those reports, like the Hampton Report, who clearly showed that regulation comes from the House of Commons. 65% of more. British law is from the EU. No, oh, I don't reckon Right, that. well, but let's leave that, park that just for the moment. I mean, you mentioned that Gordon Brown warned that leaving Europe would leave the UK like North Korea, mm. isolated and out in the cold. Mm. I mean, is that hyperbole? I mean, do Nor Norway and Switzerland, neither of which are in the EU, have yeah. much in common with North Korea? No, no, it, listen, it was article, I wouldn't have used that <laughs> comparison. But we'd certainly be out in the cold, he's absolutely right. And it's not just economics, it's also the question of an increasingly you know, worrying world in which there are some major threats, both from Russia and the Middle East. We need to confront these with a coherent, united European foreign policy, which we're finally seeing on Russia. Would you like Labour to offer a referendum? Not particularly, no, because I, I thought the actual previous government's policy, where, where the government's previous policy of having a referendum in the event of a transfer of powers was perfectly good. But listen, I'm ready for a referendum. I don't fear a referendum. It would be enormous fun. Matthew and I would be on different sides of it almost oh, sure. definitely. Right, well, Matthew's and not... I look forward right, to it. Right, OK, well, he, he thinks you would be on, on the other side, but we we'll obviously have to see how that renegotiation goes. Are you getting anywhere with Labour in terms of getting them to offer a, a referendum? I think progress has been made. I think it's really? very interesting that... What, 
what's the evidence? You know, th there are soundings out from certain top people in the Shadow Cabinet. They're unhappy that Labour didn't go for a referendum before the Tories. They can see some of their voters going to UKIP. They wish they got in there first. Right. How much money... Now, let's talk mm. about the campaign. Imagine mm. that a referendum is on its way mm. um, in a couple of years' time. You say you're ready for the battle. How much mm. money have you got in the campaign to throw at it? Well, the, the, the real raising of significant funds will happen once we know whether there's going to be a referendum. Mm. And so I, the, the position now is to ensure that companies are actually ready and know the arguments and are willing to step up to the plate, which I believe they are, because they've learnt the lessons from Scotland. And who would you have fronting the campaign? We're still working on um, exactly who that's going to be, but as Peter Manson said in your clip, all the pro-European groups have come together and we meet regularly, and I think we are in a much better position than we've been previously. Right. And do you think the in-camp is winning the argument at the moment? Because you, Gov, in February said support for staying in the EU has climbed to 45% from a low of 28% found in May direction of travel. I'm not that interested in the in, the in or out debate. You will be, though. I want to look at you know, what sort of reforms do we need and I hope that when you talk to businesses, as you do, you're discussing with them what sort of EU reforms should we have, how should we approach this renegotiation. That's the key debate, really. Right. Well, well the, the, you know, the, the, the clue is in our, in our title, which is Business for New Europe. So we've been arguing for reform for many years, Matthew, but, we, but you're more likely to get reform if you're also absolutely clear that our position is within the European Union, because that's, you get more in terms of persuading our fellow members. I or don't outside, accept that. Whichever I don't way. accept that, because, you know, take the mm. example of Scotland, for example. Did mm. Alex Salmon go to David Cameron? Can we have some reform? Can we have some more powers back? Mm. No, he called for a Scottish referendum and he got the change he wanted. So you, you need a referendum to yeah. get this change. But, but what happens within our um, union is completely different from the, the wider European Union. Matthew Elliott.